his eyes were dead. Um, his eyes had no spark of life, had no um, humanity in them. There was something wrong with the guy. And I don't mean psychologically, I mean in his creation. Evil walks amongst us. Don't kid yourself. It comes calling when you least expect it. They were small females that he could easily manhandle. Some of them he would be able to pick them up by the throat, get their feet off the ground where they couldn't fight him. I had a front row seat to evil during 30 years of investigative reporting. I'm Robert Riggs. I created True Crime Reporter to tell the backstory of cases you may never have heard of before. Austin had never had torture, kidnapping, torture, brutalization uh, by a serial sexual sadist. I pulled out my reporter's notebooks. My law enforcement sources opened up their case files. We sat down to talk, and you can listen to our journey into darkness. I've dealt with serial rapists and murderers and, and all sorts of people, but this guy was just a sexually sadistic killer that had no conscience and was a true sociopath. Be advised that this podcast is for a mature audience and not for the faint of heart. Some episodes may contain profanity and graphic details of violent crimes. To follow True Crime Reporter, text True Crime to 33777. Text True Crime, that's two words, True Crime to 33777. With that said, here we go on another journey into darkness. A Houston television station ran a regular news feature titled City Under Siege. It was no exaggeration. In 1990, the entire state of Texas was under siege. My reporter's notebook and newspaper clipping file illustrate the crime problem. In Houston, an ex-con and his accomplice ran low on gas, so they carjacked a woman stopped at a traffic signal. The ex-con shot the 22-year-old mother in the face with a 30 caliber carbine, pulled her from behind the wheel, ran over her body for good measure, and sped away with a full tank of gas. The parole board had released her killer three weeks earlier. During a routine traffic stop, an ex-con stepped out, took aim with a 357 caliber revolver, squeezed off rounds into a motorcycle officer's chest, calmly walked around the car, stood over the officer, and fired two more slugs into his head. The parole board had turned the killer loose from prison a month earlier. His rap sheet listed seven prior felony convictions. The killer had served only 13 months of a 15-year sentence for sexually assaulting a child before he was allowed to walk out of prison. In Plano, an affluent suburb of Dallas, a little girl played on a merry-go-round while her mom watched her brother play in a soccer tournament. A convicted child molester abducted the little girl, murdered her, and participated in the massive search after she went missing. He was out of prison on parole. Yet another ex-con, known as the Austin Choke Rapist, strangled and raped a 16-year-old former Miss Teen Houston contestant. The parole board had released the rapist six months earlier. He only served eight years of a 156-year sentence for choking 33 college students unconscious before he raped them. Every 20 minutes in Houston, a parole convict ransacked a home, assaulted a neighbor, stole a car, or committed some other crime. No one was immune, not even the district attorney. Thieves stole his car. Sex offenders exposed themselves to his daughter not once, but twice. You didn't have to be a genius to see a pattern here. Violent ex-con serves a fraction of his sentence. The parole board sets him free. Within a few days, he unleashes murder and mayhem. This is the story about the parole of one of those notorious ex-cons, the broomstick killer, the most sadistic serial killer in the history of Texas. I pulled out my reporter's notebook. My law enforcement sources opened up their case files we sat down to talk. 
and you can listen to our journey into darkness. He was the devil himself. I mean, he was, uh, he was the epitome of a cold-hearted, heartless, evil, dirty son of a bitch. That's the voice of Parnell McNamara, a Texas lawman from a long line of U.S. Marshals. When I first met McNamara and his brother Mike, I felt like I was back in the Old West. The McNamaras were on the trail of the most sadistic serial killer in the history of Texas, Kenneth Allen McDuff. And I was right behind them, uncovering how McDuff got out of prison on parole. McDuff drove hundreds of miles, day and night, searching for his prey, petite women who could not fight back. She was an accountant. She was a beautiful, sweet person. Uh, she had been to church that night and had stopped to wash her new sports car. McDuff spotted 28-year-old Colleen Reed at a self-serve car wash in Austin shortly after Christmas of 1991. He circled the car wash. He watched her through his dead, shark-like eyes. He drove his big, tan Thunderbird coupe into a wash bay and slipped up behind her. Most all of his victims were, for whatever reason, brunette, and they were small females that he could easily manhandle. Some of them, he would be able to pick them up by the throat, get their feet off the ground where they couldn't fight him. Neighbors heard a shrill scream car doors slam, and saw McDuff and his accomplice speed away. When police arrived, they found Colleen's keys in the ignition, her purse on the seat, soap still dripping from her car. In a split second, Colleen Reed vanished, never to be seen alive again. Gary Laverne, the author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth Allen McDuff, recalls the impact of Colleen Reed's murder. Austin had never had torture, kidnapping, torture, brutalization uh, by a serial sexual sadist. It was, it was something that, uh, you know, you might have heard about um, in California or in or New York or someplace, but not in Austin, not even in Texas. Texas has a lot of it has a lot of gun violence and so forth, but this wasn't even that. This was just pure brutality, and when it was made when it was made public, um, it 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 traumatized this city. It was during that time period that um, you 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 could pick up the paper on any day or turn on the television, and somewhere Houston, Dallas, particularly Houston. The lead story was a stranger on stranger crime, horrific violence. Uh, you know, there were even women dragged out of traffic. It, mm -hmm. it stopped at lights. And it would always, the tagline would be, they were out on parole. Mm -hmm. Describe to me that, that climate back at the time, that time. What was going on? Because you think of Texas being a law and order, but it was just the, the uh, criminals were having a field day. Well, from a political science standpoint, it was a surreal time where you had the conservative view that government spends too much and was too big. So you add to that the federal case, the Ruiz case, in which a federal judge basically takes control of the Texas prison system and says you're unconstitutionally overcrowded. And so the, um, the, the judge basically says you can either build prisons or you can uh, re relieve that overcrowding. And the only way the state of Texas can do that is through parole. So thousands upon thousands of people uh, who were once in prison were let out. 
And it, and of course, at first, the the con artist and the mm-hmm. um, the nonviolent criminal. They, they were yeah. they were. Set, and then they get to the bottom of the barrel. And then they get to the bottom of the barrel, and now you're dealing with rapists and and murderers, and people who were before the Furman case that turned all death row uh, inmates into lifers. Um, now they're eligible for parole. Now, no one believed way back in the 1970s when Furman v. Georgia happened that we would be crazy enough to parole someone who was once on death row, but that's what happened. Here's the backstory of what happened. I learned that the parole board had released 63 former death row inmates. Actually, the correct number turned out to be 85. Triple killer Kenneth Allen McDuff was among them. But another triple killer drew all of the attention and outrage. Leonardo Lopez, convicted of capital murder for executing three sheriff's deputies. Do you remember your shock? I was infuriated. I wasn't shocked. I was just outraged. I couldn't believe they would let those kind of people out. Senator Ted Lyon, the chairman of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, obtained the list of the death row inmates who had been paroled. He gave it to me and urged me to make it public. Leonardo Lopez and his accomplice committed the Trinity River Massacre in 1971. They took five sheriff's deputies hostage, drove them to the banks of the Trinity River in Dallas at night, executed three deputies, gravely wounded a fourth, a fifth narrowly escaped gunfire. The massacre spawned the biggest manhunt in Texas since Bonnie and Clyde. The murders were personal for Senator Lyon, very personal. Lyon left the Senate in 1993. Three decades later, we sat down in his law office to discuss the case. You were familiar with the Lopez case. Just just tell us how bad was it? Well, I was a young police officer in Mesquite, Texas. Uh, I think I was about 21 years old. I'd just become a police officer. And I happened to work with one of these sheriff deputies in Dallas. The sheriff's deputies would come out here, and the investigators, and if they had to go serve a warrant or something mm-hmm. like that, normally they'd get the local, or they'd come by the station. And one of those officers that was killed, I actually had worked with him on a case. And so, you know, it hit the news like a ton of bricks. Back in those days, Texas politicians talked tough on crime. They passed dozens of anti-crime bills, but they rejected building more prisons to relieve overcrowding. County sheriffs could not transfer convicted criminals to the overcrowded state prisons. Riots broke out. Republican Governor Bill Clements, a Texas oil man, responded by opening the prison floodgates. No one saw the crime wave coming. It was inconceivable. They, they didn't, they said they were for law and order, but they really weren't. All they cared about was the bottom line, the budget. They didn't want to raise taxes, and they had to raise taxes to build the prison cells that were necessary. And it was all about that. It was all about this, we're not going to raise taxes, and they campaigned on that. And then when, it, when they got into office, they found out, oh, my God, we got this problem with the prison system. We're just going to have to let these people out. It doesn't matter who they are. That was, that was what happened. The governor appointed members of the parole board. It was a plum political job. It required no criminal justice experience at all. The board released 150 inmates a day, 750 a week. They claimed the board was not under political pressure, that it was just an unspoken quota. It worked for a while until they ran out of hot check writers and petty criminals. Then the parole board scraped the bottom of the barrel. That's where they found the two triple killers, Leonardo Lopez and Kenneth McDuff. The parole board also scraped the bottom of cell blocks called administrative segregation or ADSEG. It's a prison within a maximum security prison, reserved for the most dangerous inmates. The first time I walked inside an ADSEG unit, the angry screaming and shouting reminded me of a pen full of vicious pit bulls. Guards wore raincoats to protect themselves against flying spit, urine, and feces. 
Author Gary Laverne recalls when he went inside an ADSEG unit to interview a mass murderer. What's really scary is when you go out into the general population of any of the other prisons. And, as, and I went down to administrative segregation, high security administrative segregation. The prison within a prison. The prison for the prisoners, exactly. And now that was scary. Uh, and I was glad to get out of there. When ADSEG inmates received parole, Guards locked them in handcuffs and leg irons, drove them in a cage prison van to the nearest bus station in the dead of night, handed them a bus ticket to freedom. What did that say about life to you at the time, the value of life? It was horrible. I mean, the most hypocritical person in the world is the person that says, oh, I'm, you know, in Dante's Divine Inferno, there's seven layers of hell in this book. And each layer gets hotter and hotter. But at the very bottom of hell, there is a place that's hotter than any other circle. And it's not a circle. It's just a special place that's the hottest place in hell. And it's for the political and religious hypocrites. So in the 13th century, probably when he wrote that book, he realized what kind of people that is. And that's what kind of people were serving on that parole board at that time. They were political hypocrites. Senator Lyons summoned parole board members to a hearing in the wake of my televised news report about the release of the former death row inmates. The parole board did not notify the Dallas County Sheriff or District Attorney that Lopez was up for parole. Otherwise, they would have filed a formal protest to block the release of the triple killer. Inside the red granite Capitol building built in 1885 using inmate labor, Senator Lyon called the hearing to order on April 9th of 1991. Justice Committee will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Lyon tore into the two parole board members who voted to free Lopez, especially Douglas Jew, the only member who interviewed Lopez face-to-face before approving the triple killer for parole. If you murder three police officers in Texas, all you're going to have to do is serve 16 years and you'll be out free. Why is that in the best interest of our society? Mr. Chairman, uh, personally, I share the same sentiments you have. Well, you're the one that let him out. You're the one that signed the release, and I want to know why. Don't give me any bull about your sentiments. I want to know why he's out, why it's in the best interest of our society when a guy that kills three police officers. I, you're the person that did it. Now, you tell me why it's in the best interest of our society. Mr. Chairman, I follow the guidelines that were set out by the law telling me what to do. One of the main considerations that I make as a board member is whether or not this person will be a danger to society if released into society. According to Lopez prison disciplinary record, there was no sign of rehabilitation. A formal evaluation indicated that Lopez probably would not make it outside prison in what convicts call the free world. Yet, Ron Givens, a former member of the legislature appointed to the parole board by Governor Clements, argued Lopez had been rehabilitated. Grilled by Senator Lyon, Givens made a stunning admission. Uh, How bad do people have to be before you... I mean, how many people would he have to kill before you wouldn't let him out? Crude as it might be, Senator, you know we cannot keep everyone. If we see 10 people, we're letting eight of them go, Senator. I'm going to say the things that no one want to hear. The problem is we cannot keep everyone that we need to keep. If we could do that, this would be a perfect world, and there's no way I would have let this man out. For the lack of a better word, we are raking the bottom of the barrel, Senator. We must let these people go every day. We must let these people go. We have no choice, Senator. Uh, my name is James H. Granberry. I'm uh, here representing the Board of Pardons and Paroles, and I'm currently serving as chairman of the Board of Pardons and Paroles. James Granberry, a dentist from Lubbock in West Texas, had been appointed to the parole board two years earlier by Republican Governor Bill Clements. Granberry had made a name for himself as the mayor of Lubbock during the recovery from a deadly tornado. His political credentials included an unsuccessful run for governor as a Republican. Do you think this is a good parole, Mr. Dr. Granberry? That this that this <clears throat> person should have, have you've reviewed the file? Do you think he should have been paroled? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, Senator, uh, uh, that's a hypothetical question, but I can I can re- read the record to you that uh, in uh, 
I believe uh, May of uh, 89, probably one of the first cases that I was able to review was this case, and I chose to not parole him but set him off a year, and it's in the file showing that I did vote against it one year ago. At that time, in my, in my, uh, my reasoning, I felt he wasn't ready at that time. But that's certainly not to say that the, the other two members uh, uh, doesn't cast any doubt on the, the uh, validity or the soundness of their judgment this time, sir. And then, you know, I attended hearings, and James Granberry, the chairman of the uh, parole board, would always dismiss any criticism as saying, well, we don't have a crystal ball. That was his favorite phrase. And, uh, but they were a model prisoner. I remember you and I talking that that just didn't make any sense. They weren't model prisoners. They were just running them out. They were just letting them out. Those guys were not model prisoners. They were murderers. It's been 30 years since Lyon held that hearing. When we talked about it in his law office, he said he's still angry. But one of the people that was running the system who made this decision was a former prosecutor from Dallas County. And he knew how bad these people are. But they just let them out. And the state failed, failed tremendously. And that's what you always worry about with these political hypocrites. Because they say one thing to the people, but you need to watch what they do. Because Texas has a law and order image and reputation, but this was anything but that. It was like the most liberal uh, person in government would have never done what these people did. This was intentional, and it was done knowingly and intentionally and consciously because they knew exactly what they were letting out. They knew it. They had people in the office who were former prosecutors that knew just how bad these people were. And I, I, to this day, I still don't understand it. One month after the hearing, James Granberry abruptly resigned from the parole board. Granberry left the chairmanship with four years remaining on his term. He claimed the decision was not influenced by Senator Lyon's criticism. We didn't know it at the time of the hearing, the hearing that you just listened to, that Granberry played a key role in the release of that other triple killer that I mentioned earlier in this episode. His name, Kenneth Allen McDuff, the broomstick killer. Next on True Crime Reporter, the sheriff who knew McDuff better than anyone made a prediction. And I said, mark my word. I said, I don't know if it'll be three days, three weeks, or three months, but I promise you, bodies are fixing to start showing up. And I think it was three days later. Aren't you glad it's not a crime to love reality TV? Hey, true crime lovers, this is Shannon, one of the researchers for this podcast. Paper Chaser Paper Goods is your go-to spot for all of your reality TV obsessions. Check out paperchaserpaper.com and channel your love of the Real Housewives with Paper Chaser's reality TV-themed gifts. From cocktail napkins to Bravo TV-themed invitations, Paper Chaser has everything you need to host happy hour at your place and be the it girl of your inner circle. Now remember, it's not a crime to love reality TV. Paper Chaser believes life's a party, so celebrate something every day. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the latest Paper Chaser in reality TV scoop. We'll see you on paperchaserpaper.com. True Crime Reporter is a trademarked and copyrighted news show. It is an original co-production with podcast ad reps. Hosted and written by me, Robert Riggs. Executive producer, Elizabeth Arnold. Audio production by Matt Stoker. Original music by Blair King. Associate producer, Siler Burr. Social media producer, Grace Woodward. Publicity, Tim Livingston, PR. Photography, Igor Kurgulots. Graphics, Brian David Kerr Designs. Special thanks to Gary Laverne, author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth Allen McDuff. The audio recordings of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee hearings are courtesy of the Texas State Archives. Archive sound bites included in the episodes are from my original Reporter's Notebook tape recordings. And for our listeners who stayed to hear the credits, here's a little bonus. Melissa Northrup, she disappeared in the middle of the night. A vehicle was found 100 feet away or more. 
a tan Thunderbird. And the registration went back to Kenneth Allen McDuff. And when that, when those little facts were known, um, it so happened on that day that Mike and Parnell McNamara, who are our marshals in Waco, and they were two of my three best friends at the time, they were meeting me. We we're going to go to lunch together. We went to lunch almost every day. And they walked down the steps, and I was coming to pick them up of the at the federal building. And a young, new-to-town FBI agent happened in the same path and said to ask them, have you ever heard of Kenneth McDuff? And they said, good gosh, of course we have. What's happened? They, and the fellow said, well, his car was found nearby where this girl is missing, went missing a day or so ago. 